This is April. And this is Tiffany. And you are now listening to the Tea of Life podcast. Today we have Allison Hodges. Yes. <laughs> and she is a very busy woman. So most people True. probably know you as Kid Stuff Actor. Yes. All right. So you actually do that at Woodstock City. Mm-hmm. Plus other Every surrounding Every single churches. campus I was at at some point last season. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. So they also may know you as the storyteller in Upstreet. Yes. Which is for our elementary age children. Mm-hmm. So you're on the stage pretty much everywhere you go. Every opportunity someone gives me for a microphone, I rarely turn down. <laughs> yes. So you're also a regular at our local theater. Yes. Where you're actually working on it's Fancy Nancy, the musical. So it's for little kiddos. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, anyone is welcome, obviously, but little ones are, it's geared toward that audience. Okay. It's called a theater for young audience, actually. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the, it's a, it's a kind of musical. So it's adults playing kid characters. I'm the only adult character. I'm Nancy's mom. Okay. And so all the other characters, and it's a small ensemble, just six of us. So the other five actors are all playing the kid parts from those books that we all love. Very cool. So that is actually at our local mm-hmm. Performing Arts Center. So mm-hmm. what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a, a link in our show notes awesome. for that so people can go and check that out and maybe Great. even take their kids and go awesome. check you out on that stage. We open July 11th, and so it's coming up soon. And there are fun, interactive things with the cast before and after, like fashion show and mm. photo opportunities oh, and wow. ice cream socials. So uh-huh. yeah, come check it out. Oh, that sounds amazing. So something else that you actually do is you are a LuLaRoe stylist. Yes. And this is something that you're also passionate about. Yes. I love, um, I didn't know that I was going to love until I started really doing it, watching women come alive in their confidence. And I didn't, because I've never been a clothing person really, um, but when I began to see myself and my own confidence begin to change because of comfort level and how I felt in it and then getting to help women do that also and watching their faces light up and be excited to look at themselves in a mirror when maybe mm-hmm. they hadn't been excited to do that in a long time. So it's been a fun journey to walk alongside our customers and do that. Yeah, I know when you first started that, you were a little bit unsure, mm-hmm. but then you kind of dove in. And yeah. when you do something... You are all in. I don't want to do it if it's not 110% Mm -hmm. because then it doesn't feel genuine to me and doesn't, it's, if I can't do it 110%, then I'll tell you no. So we'll also put a link to that in our show notes for your LuLaRoe page. So based on what we just talked about with you loving the stage, Mm -hmm. this will come as no surprise to our audience that you Mm -hmm. graduated with a degree in theater. I did. And? And, um, yeah, I also... So I got a BA in theater, but also have a minor in speech communications, which then I also, I just felt like the Lord was asking me in college, I had no idea how that would ever be used, if it would ever be used, but that I was supposed to get my teaching degree as well. So I never declared a double major. I just did all the work for it. Mm -hmm. So I was always taking 18 to 20 hours every semester, and I graduated Technically, with a BA in theater, minor speech communications, but I'm also certified to teach secondary education in drama and speech. So back to when I said you're a busy girl, this is actually confirming what I was saying in the beginning. Yes, I was not taught as a child to rest very well. (laughs) We were taught how to work hard and Uh even play hard. Like we worked and played hard. We just didn't rest hard, (laughs) if that is a phrase. Yeah. So we're always going. (laughs) Actually, my, this may, I don't know if you want this information. My maiden name is German and and it's Mm Unruh. I can't pronounce it the right way in German. But when you look that word up in the German dictionary, it actually means nonstop, Mm. unrest. It's a piece in a clock that is always moving. So is this your entire family? Oh, all Unruhs, I think, are wired. Yes, this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually do have another friend, last name Unruh. We had this discussion. Oh, right. Yeah. A long time ago. And, um, same with her. Interesting. Yeah, she is same. Going. Absolutely. I don't know if it's the German heritage. I don't know, but yeah. we're always mm-hmm. going. Yes. Yeah. So another thing about Allison is she is a fantastic host. Mm. Anytime anybody ever gets the opportunity to come to her house mm. for any kind of event, I encourage you to do so because she loves to love on the people mm. that she brings into her home. And Indeed. if you come into her home, then you will definitely feel that. Mm. It's been intentional because we're busy when we have the opportunity to have people in our home. And actually, Jason and I were just talking about this, that it's a value in our marriage and we want to be better at it. And so we have a goal that 
once a month. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you look at a family's it's a schedule, lot. that once a month we want to be intentional with inviting or doing or incorporating people into our home mm-hmm. better than we already do. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, you're very good at that. So Thanks. It seems like it comes very easily for you. It's taught well. So you're also a mom of three kiddos. Yes. And a wife to Jason for four. Almost 14. Almost 14 mm-hmm. years. This September. Okay. All right. So, and Jason also happens to be my husband's boss. So this interview needs to go really well. <laughs> really well. <laughs> really well. Brandon, thanks for the awesome microphone. Yes. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to add? No, I have my kiddos right now. They are 11, 9, and 7. So that'll be, we have a rising sixth grader, Mm. rising fourth grader, and rising second grader. And the girls are all things performance. My son actually might be the most talented, but he won't have anything to do with it because his sisters do. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Um, We just started him with some drum lessons, which Mm -hmm. I think actually um, he thinks is pretty cool. Um, so, yeah. yeah, so they're fun. It's a fun new season to be in. So how is it with you and having a rising middle schooler? You know, actually awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, we are in a sweet season of her kind of coming back around. The last two years, she hasn't necessarily wanted, she hasn't been as physically affectionate, but I, for some reason, I wasn't expecting this, but the last five months or so, she's been more huggy, more Mm -hmm. hold my hand, more, it's interesting. I don't know if it's her not wanting to quite grow up and so, so holding on to that Mm -hmm. a little bit, but she has gotten to begin, gotten to begin. Is that a right (laughs) phrase? Anyway, we're making it one right now. (laughs) Volunteering in our Wombaland, our um, preschool environment at church. Mm -hmm. And she has been so excited to get to do that. And she actually helps the two-year-olds in their large group worship. So Mm -hmm. she travels with like three or four other girls to their classroom because they're still too little to go to their little large group, but they bring it to them and they do worship and tell the Bible story. And so she loves that. And then she's also begun to go to our middle school environment. And I already see change for the better. And she's been there a month, maybe Mm -hmm. in transit. Mm -hmm. And to be able to tell her at night, Caroline, I already Mm -hmm. see a difference. And I just Mm -hmm. want you to know, I notice when I ask you, hey, could you do this? None of the asking is different. The asking is still there to help, to be a part, to do chores, whatever. But her response to my ask is drastically different. Mm-hmm. There is not the sigh and the uh, and a little bit of an eye roll that then you have to circle back and go, no, sorry. Mm-hmm. You don't get to roll your eyes at mom. Right. But she now is going, okay. Oh, my gosh. Guys, it's a game changer. And I asked her about it. And she goes, mom, it's transit. Like, we've been doing this series. Mom, we do series now. Like, it's not like Upstreet. Where in my brain, I'm like, you didn't realize that Upstreet does a series series as well. well. They just don't call it that, (laughs) you know? Mm -hmm. But she's like, Mom, we do series in middle school. And we've been doing this one called Keep Out. And it's all about your relationship with your parents. And she's telling me these things. And I'm like, well, I just want you to know that I notice. And I'm proud of you. And so... It's great with my middle schooler, and I wish that for every oh, parent. Absolutely, there is no. I think another big part of this, and mm-hmm. this is a whole other podcast, mm-hmm. I'm sure, for another time. <laughs> we can do is, that. Is <laughs> um, there's no telephone. Mm-hmm. There's no social media. Even mm-hmm. though she's asking for it in lots and lots of fifth graders, I don't think a telephone is evil. I don't think social media no. is evil. Mm-hmm. I think my 11 year old, my 11 year old, doesn't need to have it. Right. So. I think that's been a game changer. She doesn't Mm -hmm. know about social things she's missing out on already. Mm -hmm. And she already is because I see it on social Mm -hmm. media. She's already missing out on drama. And how does that make you feel as a mom? I love it. She's protected. Yeah. I, she, you only get to be a kid Mm -hmm. for a little bit and her eyes are already being open to the world and she's had some grieving about that because they've begun mm-hmm. to study things like World War II. And mm-hmm. she loves American history. She gets her hands on every historical fiction novel she can read. However, they began to learn about World War II this year. And she was over there in that bathroom on the floor sobbing <sighs> over the depravity of man. And mm-hmm. she could not believe that someone would do what Hitler had done. Mm-hmm. 
And then that took her to then her finding out about some of the school shootings that have gone on. Cause mm-hmm. we don't watch the news in our home and yeah, we don't, either. we don't really mm-hmm. um, bring a lot of that information to them because I don't think they know how to process it yet. Right. But they had talked about it at school and she goes, mom, I know about the school shooting. And I said, okay, what do you think about that? And she just began to weep and to talk about it. And why would anyone, you know, he must've been, um, he didn't know what he was doing. I said, actually, it was very thought out. And mm-hmm. so beginning to talk to your child about evil. And so from mm-hmm. that standpoint, her eyes are already being opened to sin, the depravity of man, to evil in the world on a scale she hasn't known beyond Disney. Mm-hmm. And um, she doesn't need the drama of the social world as well. She has a few precious friends. And she honestly thinks that she's friends with everyone, mm-hmm. which I love. So I'll ask a question. He goes, oh, yeah, mom, those are my friends from school. Okay, awesome. Do you want to ask him to hang out? No, nah, I'm good. All right. So yeah, there's a long answer to. Yeah, we could probably do a whole other podcast. Probably. On this. My son, yes. actually, we didn't allow him to have a cell phone until he turned 16. Yep, that's kind of what we're thinking. At that point, it was almost a because you know with with him being in the high school yeah. environment at church yeah. and them doing. Um, they'll do like weekend activities yeah. or they'll yeah. do whatever, and it just got to the point to where I'm like. Texting his friends. Mm-hmm. You're going, like, yeah. where, where is, are you meeting? Where's Gabriel? And yeah. I was like, this is not appropriate. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. He needs to be able to do that now. This should not be happening. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. So that was when, for his 16th birthday, yeah. we gave him a phone with limited yes. data yes. access and limited, you know. But, so wise. But he still has. And he has. And whenever we text him or call him, he has, has to, to answer. Yep. He cannot be like, oh, I'll get back mm-hmm. to you later. No, well, I have a friend like that they did the exact same thing. I think it's like the Christmas before they turned 16, Mm -hmm. they were given a phone with limited social media and her daughter came to her after just a few months of having it. And she came to her and thanked her mom for waiting until she was that age because she already felt inundated Mm -hmm. now with all the choices to make socially and all of this stuff. So I love that then a 16 year old daughter came back to her mom and said, thank you for not letting me have a phone even though I begged you for one. Wow. So that wow. keeps me Yeah, G- focused. Gabriel never even asked for oh, one. Hope, because he, hope my he seven-year-old knew, is asking. He knew, like, <laughs> at the point that when we gave it to him, you know, we, we were at, right. do you want, well, I didn't think that I would be able to have one. Right. I didn't think y'all would let me have one. Right. So I thought, that's actually really cool that yeah. he knows Already. Our limitations yes. already enough to where he wasn't pushing those yeah. boundaries. Oh, yeah. well, my parents have decided not to do that, yeah. so I'm just going to respect that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so then yeah. We, yeah, and then we told our 12-year-old, you know, your brother got one at 16. You have four years. Yeah. Like, don't think just because. Yes. Because that's always the the, I need the to second have and then then, I should have you know, the third and fourth child is yes, hope. you, oh, you make them wait mm-hmm. to a certain age to do something, and then they're allowed to do it. But then they have younger siblings mm-hmm. who are still in that environment mm-hmm. who get that same thing mm-hmm. at a younger age. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, well, you look, yeah, that easily. I mean, Hope is watching... She's the seven-year-old movies that Caroline wouldn't have watched right. at seven, but exactly. because she has older siblings. So yes, there is that balance and like getting their ears pierced. Mm-hmm. It was a big deal in our home and letting Hope mm-hmm. know, you know, Caroline did get to do it at nine, but that's because we saw responsibility in her. We saw all these mm-hmm. things, but so if we don't feel you're ready at nine, it won't happen at night. Right. Oh, you know, not that it would be earlier. Right. It might be later. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. Ooh, totally. Yes. <laughs> totally. So you grew up in Kansas mm-hmm. on a family farm, correct? This is true. Now, so, I can fulfill most stereotypes that you want in your brain about a Kansas girl across the street from a dairy farm. We had six and a half acres. We didn't have farm animals. We had mm-hmm. a ton of cats and dogs. Um, and we had a ginormous garden okay. that we you worked in the garden before you did anything, especially mm-hmm. in the summer because that's when everything's growing. Before you went swimming, and swimming was at the neighbor's pond, and uh, my brother would catch fish and throw them in the inner tube with me, and I would scream Mm -hmm. and shout, and when you're walking up the ladder at the dock, your toes would get nibbled on by fish. Terrorizing. (laughs) Terrorizing. Do your kids go swimming in that same pond? (laughs) No, we don't. My parents don't live in that home anymore, so no. I'm trying to think if they ever did go swimming before they moved. No. They did not have the pleasure of that (laughs) pond. A different pond, but not Mm -hmm. that pond. Yes. So the stuff that you grew, was that for yourself or did you guys sell it? or No, it was for our family. I'm sure my parents gave away a ton. That's Mm -hmm. just kind of who they were. But mama canned it and that's what sustained us through the winter. Yeah. 
Laura Ingalls Wilder right here. And do you have a garden yourself? No. No. (laughs) Because I was probably so traumatized by having to work. Now, here's what I will say about a garden. Strawberry rhubarb pie from fresh strawberries and rhubarb that you've just gotten that day or mama's strawberry shortcake will never be better than the day you get it from the garden. And mashed potatoes will never be better than the day you dig them out of the garden. Okay. They are... It, I just, there aren't words for potato harvest day was awful because it was so hot. Oh yeah. And you're dirty and gross and sweaty, but you got to go swimming as soon as you were done shucking corn in the shade of a tree. Like I literally am everybody's stereotype right here. <laughs> um, snapping peas. Yes. <laughs> I can't remember. We didn't have a farm, but my mom used to have beans delivered to her house from yes. friends who had yes. barns. And we, she would literally, like they would come in bushels yes. and they would take them, we would put a, a, a sheet down on the floor yep. in front of the TV yep. and You'd they would snap. dump them all mm-hmm. and we would sit and watch soap operas yes. and snap soap all of them. <laughs> no, right? Yes. yes. Oh, yes. Perfect. Amazing. <laughs> and we would snap all oh, the yeah. beans and string them yep. and she would can them all. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Canning, yes. And I, um, to this day, won't eat beets because of how my mom, how they were canned. Okay. Um, Because when you go down to the root cellar, that's what we called it. I don't know what people call it here in the South. It was in the basement and it was where you stored your extra food. Yeah. Kind of like a storm shelter. Right. It was an unfinished part of the basement. Uh Uh-huh. Rudimentary shelves, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I hated going in there. One little light that you had to run in and pull the string (laughs) and I'm terrified of the dark and some creature, right? You'd go down and get that jar of beets that mama sent you down there to get. Sorry, audience, listeners, but it looked like poop Mm -hmm. because it had been canned. And so they had turned brown. Oh, and But mom served them because that's what we had. Uh And so I won't eat beets. So not even fresh beets? No, I can't. I just... mm -mm. Okay. And I don't even know if I'd like the flavor. Mm -hmm. I was just... It tastes like dirt. (laughs) Traumatized. Yes. Because it's a root vegetable. (laughs) But different than a sweet potato. (laughs) Like, why can't it taste like a I've never had rhubarb. Oh, rhubarb looks like even, celery. Okay. So it's a stalk. Okay. And a strawberry rhubarb pie because it's going to make your jaw hurt right here. Okay. It's so tart. So, okay. Ugh, so good. Okay. Now my, I'm you're right. You're salivating right it, now. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Yes. Strawberry rhubarb pie fresh out of the garden. That's okay. the way to go. So like I said, you grew up in Kansas on a farm. Yes. So you went to Texas Christian University. Fort Worth, home of the Horn Frogs. Okay. So yes. I saw that. Horn Frogs. <laughs> my immediate thought yeah. was... Maybe I don't know what a horn frog is. It's after an actual all. real life thing. So I Googled it. Yeah, you did. And I saw mm-hmm. and I thought, why? It's a horned toad. Okay. It has little spikes. Yeah. And its defense mechanism uh-huh. is if it's being attacked by an enemy, this is amazing, really. It shoots blood out of its eyes. Can you imagine if you had that superpower? It would freak <laughs> people out, right? <laughs> I love that. Yes, that's their defense mechanism. <laughs> okay, a little redemption there. I, I can see that. They're small. Um, They're yes. mighty. <laughs> mighty blood squirters. They are small and mighty. Small and mighty. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So how old were you when you first realized that you wanted to act? Oh, mom says I came out of the womb in high heels. Okay. <laughs> um, she tells stories of me at, like, age three at, like, we have this restaurant called Pooch's Cafeteria. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's cafeteria food, right? It's uh-huh. the, what do they call it? The sneeze guard. You know, you go through the yep. line and get mm-hmm. your food. Mm-hmm. Well, there's this place called Pooch's. We didn't get to eat out. You didn't eat out back then right. like we do now. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a special deal. It was at the mall. But they mom says there was this like rock wall kind of thing. And I would stand up there and just sing for whoever. Oh. I, I don't remember a don't. time that I haven't performing. Do you remember doing that? Performing. I don't remember that instance. Uh-huh. I don't doubt it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Growing up where we did, there was no one around. But I thought that if I sang loud enough outside, Mm -hmm. that a producer in New York would hear me Mm -hmm. and hire me. But yes, performing (laughs) is in my blood. My brother, he cannot understand musical theater. Mm -hmm. He's he's that guy that scored higher on the SAT in seventh grade than I ever did as a senior in high school. Okay. He's that brain. And he just could not understand why anyone, musical theater is so far-fetched. Who breaks out into song and dance in the middle of the street? And I was like, have you met Um, your sister? Me. I do. I break into song and dance in the middle of the street. And he was like, oh, right. Okay. So there's that. Yes. 
And your brother is older? He's older three and a half years. Okay, so not only were you like doing that, but you're also the annoying oh, younger sister. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. He took great like pride in that, in that crown. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. What was your very first like stage performance? Sure. I'm sure there was stuff at church. My mm-hmm. mom used to write musicals for the children's okay. choir. Yeah. But the first like show. So this is in your blood then? Oh, yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. My mom was a recording artist. She has two or three albums. Oh, wow. She had a singing okay. group when I was a young girl. Wow, I didn't know that. The Misos, Ministry and Songs of Salvation. Okay. Very 70s, 80s. Do they have a Facebook page? Oh, gosh, no. They okay. do not. <laughs> so I can't put a link to that. <laughs> no. I don't even know that you would Can ever we create find one it. really fast? That would be amazing because their pictures from back then were spot on. But Mama had these shoes that she only wore to perform in these black mm. stiletto heels that had a plastic um, thing that went over where your toes are yeah. and a gold chain around her ankle. Ooh. Oh, So gosh. how many times did you sneak those out of oh, her Oh, I was not. I only could stare at them. Okay. I was never allowed to play in them, sadly. <sighs> okay, so first <laughs> musical I ever did, third grade, the local high school was doing The Sound of Music. Mm-hmm. And so I auditioned for The Sound of Music, was cast as Marta, the mm-hmm. second youngest. Okay. I will be turning seven on Tuesday, and I'd like a pink parasol. I believe that was my first line. Yep. And I loved every single thing about that. And then from then on, my family, there was a great outdoor theater that I grew up performing at called Shawnee Mission Theater in the Park. And there is nothing like it here. And Like, I just thought that mm-hmm. every community had these. Um, no. It was community theater with the caliber and quality of professionals. And I performed in front of 3,000-plus people wow. at night. Wow. And it was, they did four shows in the summer. You got two weekends. And so the summer before sixth grade, my mom, my aunt, mm-hmm. my grandfather, and myself all did Annie. Oh, and that wow. was the Unruh family taking uh-huh. over. And it was <laughs> awesome. And then from there on, mom and I did shows together almost every summer. And then she then began to start direct directing out there. And I kept performing through college. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a great training ground to yeah. learn about performing. I mean, you're in front of thousands of people. how cool that it was right there in your hometown. Hometown. Now, we say hometown, but it was a 45-minute drive to get to. We live in because, Atlanta. Well, true. That's hometown. Yeah. Okay. So, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, it was local for sure. Yeah. But it was an amazing experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, what are any acting blunder stories that you might have? Oh, if when I ask you that, sure. what is the first thing that pops in your head? Uh, freshman year of high school, I was we did 42nd Street. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a tap-heavy, awesome, old-school musical, Lullaby of Broadway, um, Come On Along and Listen to, that whole, it's, anyway, it's an amazing <laughs> show. Um, he didn't need me to start singing the soundtrack, sorry. But um, as a freshman, I was cast as the lead. Peggy Mm -hmm. Sawyer, and that didn't go over well with upperclassmen, so that was a whole interesting character-building experience. However, we would do teasers for the school body, so where you did maybe three three numbers from the show to try to get the students excited to come to the show, right? Mm -hmm. So we're doing this big tap number. Um, I believe it was We're in the Money. And all of the women, because it's a very 1930s kind of feel, we all had wigs on. Mm -hmm. And I had quick change after quick change after quick change. And that particular musical is a show within a show. And so we were doing the show within a show part. Mm -hmm. And it's this song, and we all have platinum blonde pin curl wigs on with our we're in the money costumes and I go for the last flat ball change spin pose and when I spin my wig flies off oh, my no. head I grab it and then the scrim came down in front of me pose it was amazing <laughs> so yeah so that was awesome that is awesome uh-huh um in college I mean I'm sure there were others but in college I could not or I'm on stage and the actor that's supposed to be making their entrance, they cannot get their zipper to work Mm -hmm. and they're supposed to be changing clothes. Yeah. So I am out there just winging it. (laughs) And that is the most, it was probably 30 seconds, a minute, you know, but it was horrifying. Mm -hmm. That's why you always got to know your backstory. You got to know what would I keep saying if nobody ever interrupted me? (laughs) Lordy. So... That was interesting. <laughs> yes. Those are the two that come to mind right away. So how do you typically prepare? I'm all business when I go to rehearsal because I don't want my time wasted. Mm-hmm. 
I, um, I treat it like a job, even if I'm not being paid, probably because of the desire for excellence. Mm-hmm. So typically, if I show up to rehearsal, you know, I'm back. I mean, I, it's all of those training, the hours and hours and hours of vocal training and dance training. You, the way you rehearse is the way you'll perform. And mm-hmm. so if it's just a vocal rehearsal, you bet I'm there with a pencil in hand. I'm sitting on the edge of my seat. I'm working vocals. If it's a dance rehearsal, I am in the shoes I'm going to be dancing in in the show. If we're blocking and rehearsing, once I know, like if I'm in a skirt for mm-hmm. the show, I rehearse in a skirt to the floor and in high heels the entire rehearsal process. Because if I wait until the week before when we're in costume to finally start dancing Mm -hmm. in high heels, in a long dress, doing falls, doing whatever kind of um, things like that, I know. Yeah. Uh -uh. So you got to, I practice it the way I'm Mm going to perform it. Mm -hmm. I like to be memorized the next rehearsal after something's been blocked. And not everybody works that way, but Mm -hmm. I... I have a hard time memorizing before a director has blocked a scene. So I, um, yeah, that's kind of how I run. Like tomorrow we have an all day rehearsal, nine to five. I will be exhausted afterwards, but Mm -hmm. it's important, you know, and it's necessary. Now I have a ton of fun when I'm there, but I am very focused and I don't do well when others don't come ready to work. That is hard for me. Yeah. So as a director, like I'm going to have an opportunity, you didn't ask this question, but I'm going to have an opportunity next summer to direct at Elm Street. And I'm actually going to direct and choreograph The Wizard of Oz. Oh, wow. And I'm super excited about that. Mm-hmm. And I've already been thinking, I just, I know me and mm-hmm. I know how those rehearsals will be. And it's going to be fun, but it's going to be work. Yeah. And so, and their time will be used from seven to 10. Yeah. Like if whatever time period I'm given, we're going to use it all. Yeah. Um, rarely will you get let out early, but if I don't need you, you're out of there. You know, mm-hmm. if I called you, then I'm working mm-hmm. what you're doing. So that's kind of how I function in that environment. Um, do you clog? <laughs> no, but I do tap. <laughs> My daughter saw a sign. She's like, you know, it was like clogging lessons uh-huh. posted on the side of the road. She's like, what is clogging? I was like, oh, how do I describe this? <laughs> Think of it like mm-hmm. a version of tap. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very rhythmic, but it is not tap. It is <laughs> Appalachian Mountain tap. It is. I don't know how you describe it. I'm just going to let you keep on going right. because I used to clog. Oh, did you? Oh, good. And I'm digging myself with listeners and you, Tiffany. No, it's okay. I don't clog. However, no, but you are I love right. listening to it. Mm-hmm. You're right. Yeah. It's a little mountainy. It is. I don't know how else to describe it. It's fun. Yes. I love knowing that about you now. (laughs) It's been years. Hey. It's been years. Once you ride a bike. Yeah. Yeah. It would just take a refresher. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I have actually seen those those signs on the side of the road. You've thought about it. You have. have Crossed my mind. Perhaps when you're empty nesters, you're going to be like, Brandon, guess what I'm doing? (laughs) Plugging lessons. Yeah. Exactly. (laughs) Don't worry. The hard words will be fine. (laughs) Practice in the garage. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. On the concrete. On the bus, concrete. Bust yes. my hiney. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's happened a few times. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I've set up the platform here okay. to show exactly how busy you are. Yep. To show how full your life is, how mm-hmm. much you enjoy living the life mm-hmm. that you live, how much you enjoy your family, mm-hmm. the things that you um, creating mm-hmm. and acting mm-hmm. and just in, in an abundance. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I want to set that up to say that you actually have type 1 diabetes. I do. And so a lot of times when we hear that somebody suffers from something like Mm -hmm. that, we think our life is over. Mm. We think everything stops. Mm -hmm. We can't continue. Mm -hmm. And we're not able to, you know, enjoy our life anymore. Mm -hmm. So that was why I wanted to talk about Mm. all those things with you. And I want to set the, the stage here, mm-hmm. no pun intended, right? <laughs> to talk about your type 1 diabetes. Great. Okay. So you were diagnosed, you said, at age 25. Mm-hmm. So tell us about that. Yeah, it was actually, my birthday's in March and I was diagnosed in February. <clears throat> and I mean, I'm a young single adult and I was living back at home. I was in a job I did not like as most mid twenties, right? Nobody's in their dream job at 25. And, um, 
I was just thirsty all the time. Mm-hmm. And there was no, there's no family history. So this was not on anyone's radar. And I'm my in my mid-20s, I am this thin, <laughs> active woman, right? <coughs> Pardon me. And I began losing weight. Mm-hmm. And I was thirsty all the time. And I'm already, if you haven't figured this out, dramatic. <laughs> and which can be moody, some people might say. <laughs> I don't know. No. <laughs> um, I feel things deeply and wear my heart on my sleeve. But I was even more so moody. And my mom watched me one weekend going back and back and back, getting different things to drink, trying different things. Water. Nope, that's not working. Okay. Lemonade. Pop. All these things. Now that I know I'm diabetic, I'm like, holy Moses. But that particular weekend, and then she jokingly said, I wonder if you're diabetic. Like we all just kind of laughed because Mm -hmm. there was no cause to think that. My best friend growing up, he and his family lived right down the street and actually at the pond that I used to go swimming in. They were the second owners of that house. And his parents, his mom was a nurse, his dad was a a podiatrist. And so they just, you know, we kind of shared with them what was going on. And they said, and his dad said, just swing by my office one day and we'll check your blood sugar. Mm -hmm. So I did mid morning one day in February. And like, I think it was like the 20. 6th or 7th of February and checked my blood sugar and he must have prepped his staff ahead of time because she checked it and it was 476 or something. Now your normal range Mm -hmm. needs to be like 80 to 140. Okay. And so I'm well over that. And his sweet nurse looked at me. She goes, you know what? I bet these are old test strips. We'll check it again. And she leaves the room. My um, neighbor comes in. He goes, Allison, hey, I'll pick up some new test strips. We'll go on back to work. We'll do it at home tonight. And I'm sure he already knew right then mm-hmm. I'm diabetic. Absolutely. And he's calling my parents mm-hmm. to prep them ahead of time, mm-hmm. I'm sure. I show up at their house uh, after dinner that evening. And we check my blood sugar. And it had gone up, but just slightly like 490, I think we were at. And he just looked at me and I started to cry and he started to cry and my parents started to cry and he said, you're diabetic. And um, so from there, he said, do you want to go talk about that? And I remember he was, I adore that family. He took me down in their basement. I'm sure my parents, I think they probably stayed upstairs to talk with his wife about Mm -hmm. what this all meant. I can't believe I didn't go to the hospital now that I know what I know. But Mm -hmm. there, yeah, it was 18, 17, 18 years ago. So we go down in their basement. And because my only frame of reference is still Magnolias. Mm, Yep. Is Shelby Mm -hmm. dying. Right. That is my only frame of reference for a diabetic. I didn't know any diabetics. There was one kid in my elementary school that had diabetes, but he wasn't around. Like, he didn't grow up the whole school Mm -hmm. period with us. He was just there for a few years in elementary school. Um, So, yeah, I'm imagining me losing limbs Mm -hmm. and losing my life. Right. And so we begin to talk down in the basement. And he, I said, okay, am I going to die? He goes, not if you take care of yourself. I said, okay, am I going to lose limbs? Not if you take care of yourself. Am I going to go blind? Not if you take care of yourself. And then I said, am I going to be able to have babies? He said, absolutely, if you take care of yourself. So it's a good thing that I'm the Lord wired me the way he did. I'm a your firstborn female type A, make lists. My You're brother, all in. This oh, is yes. you are all, all in. in. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And my brother says, while he hates the fact that I have it, Darren would have forgotten he had it. Darren would, it would have been... Because he was this Mm -hmm. brain stuck in some entrepreneurial thing that he's Mm -hmm. creating. And he would have forgotten that he was diabetic, you Mm -hmm. know, where. So of the two of us kids to get it, I was the right one to get it. If there was going to be a child in our family, because I would pay attention to it and I would take care of myself. So Mm -hmm. it was difficult in the beginning. I felt like the disease was controlling me. And I felt very damaged. Mm -hmm. And what man will ever want to marry a woman with a chronic illness Mm -hmm. that's never going away? Um, They talk that 
they hope to cure it, you know, and I have an awesome endocrinologist here. Shout out to Atlanta Diabetes Associates, Dr. Bodie and his PA Joe. I adore them. Um, and they are on the cusp of amazing research. And he thinks five to 10 years, we could have a cure. Mm. Oh, that would be amazing. But I don't, um, I don't allow myself to sit in that place of hope for a cure. And I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, I do just every day. And so in those early years of diagnosis, it was difficult to not see myself as damaged or um, dreading sharing with the man I w- would fall in love with that I'm mm-hmm. diabetic. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Lord gave me the perfect right man. Right. He doesn't even, because I wear a pump, it's attached to me all the time. He's like, I don't even see it. Yeah. I'm like, how can you not? Like, I've added a new piece of hardware recently, and we can talk about that later. It's a Dexcom continuous glucose monitors, Mm -hmm. but it's another thing that's stuck inside me Mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And as a woman, um, for a long time, I only did shots Mm -hmm. because I did not want to be on a pump because people would see it. And you, you have to get creative with how you wear clothing. You always have to have a waistband. Um, if you're wearing a pump, Mm -hmm. so you have something to clip it onto. Um, so, and I can imagine that would be as a 25 year old. I mean, yes. Yes. And it's husband and wife. I mean, you know, absolutely. And that was Mm -hmm. part of it, you know, in those early, but Jason, eh, he's just awesome. And he Mm -hmm. just, he loves me for me and he Mm -hmm. loves my story. And this is how God made me. Okay. He's so even keeled to my crazy, so it's perfect. <laughs> um, but yeah, those early moments of diagnosis, it was interesting and hard. But my parents, I mean, I was a young adult, so I did everything. I went and mm-hmm. I went to the education classes. They didn't. You know, it's it's very different than if you have a child. Um, the parents are very much so mm-hmm. involved with that. But as a young adult, you know, it was me. And I was making the decisions and thankful for insurance, but if there was a fluke with something with insurance, the amount of money, I mean, Mm, each test strip I think is 50 cents Yeah, each and you're testing six to eight times a day. So just test strips, not including (sighs) insulin, you Mm -hmm. know, not including needles, not including any of the supplies you might need. I switched to an insulin pump after I'd been diabetic. I had just moved here to Atlanta and I felt like I had been kind of living in fear Mm -hmm. of a pump and of technology and stuff. And the Lord just really grabbed my heart and was like, if the technology is there, you need to use it. Someday, you're not married now, but someday Mm -hmm. you hope to be and you hope to have children. Mm -hmm. How great to already be so comfortable with the technology by the time you are pregnant so you can manage being pregnant to the best of your ability. Right. So to seize every opportunity... So especially in those early years before I was married and I was single, I would be a part of their research studies because I could. It was Mm -hmm. easy to get down there, even though it was an hour drive to my doctor once I was here in Atlanta. I participated in research studies because I thought, if this is going to help, why would I not? And so I did those things. Um, Then I get married and... Then we, two years into marriage, decide to start a family, and that is a whole different ball of mm. wax to be pregnant. The first three months are crazy intense. No, I'm sure it's not. It's not a decision where you can say, "Oh, let's just let's start a family." Okay, I mean, this your has blood to be sugars, planning. Yeah. You have to probably yeah. had to do like pre doctor's visits. You oh, probably sure. Had to do a lot of your. They want your blood sugars to be perfect, mm-hmm. and that's hard mm-hmm. because I could, as a diabetic, eat the exact same thing every day at the exact same time, exercise, be active. I could do everything, and my blood sugars would still be different mm. from day to day. It's a giant chemistry experiment every day. Um, <clears throat> so for someone who can err, I work on this, on the perfectionism side of life, this can be hard because my blood sugars aren't perfect and they mm-hmm. aren't. And why did that happen? I, I dosed correctly based on the mathematical equation that we have. And I did all of these things right yet. Oh, maybe I was, the wind blew differently today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> my mood, your mood affects it. Right. Your hormones, your maybe? monthly I'm cycle sure, right? affects it. Your mm-hmm. everything uh, affects it. Mm-hmm. So 
And in those early years, you're in a honeymoon phase where your body is still producing a little bit of insulin, okay. but then your body produces less and less and less the further you get into prognosis. Okay. So now there's nothing mm-hmm. being produced um, because I'm so far in, mm-hmm. but those early months, there was still a little bit being. Mm-hmm. So it was, it's just hard. Yeah. So I made the decision. We just decided to start a family and your blood sugars have to be perfect. And the weight that it wasn't just me that was mm. going to be affected by diabetes anymore. Right. Now it's a whole other life mm-hmm. because in those first three months, the quality of your blood sugars determines how things form. Oh, okay. So any of the birth defect stuff right. that would be directly related to diabetes and the mismanagement of high blood sugars, that's what's going to show up. So I was under not just my OB's care, but then a specialist's care. And I was there a lot and they're checking things at sonograms to make sure it's just way more intense. Um, I remember the, them studying the brain and the heart intently at each of those pregnancies, <clears throat> making sure there are not just four chambers, but that the blood flows correctly, that there are no defects, that the brain, there are two hemispheres, that yes, all arms, legs, fingers, toes, like each of those checklist things were a big deal because mm-hmm. it was directly related to how good my blood sugars were. Um, <clears throat> now, then you have to give yourself the open-handedness in your relationship with the Lord, too, of going, okay, but he could still, I, my blood sugars could have been perfect and the Lord could have decided for that child for them to have whatever, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And um, so on those appointments where, 10 fingers, 10 toes, four chambers of a heart, two hemispheres of a brain. Yes, we were rejoicing Mm -hmm. big time. Um, The second and third trimester were not as complicated as far as it messing up disfigurement, you know, or uh, congenital heart defect or blindness or things like that. It was now the growth of the baby because diabetics carry bigger babies. And Mm -hmm. then the mom is more at risk for high blood pressure, um, preeclampsia, all of that stuff. So with Caroline, I did develop preeclampsia at 37 weeks. Mm -hmm. And so they induced and she was born. Um, But because of preeclampsia, I'm on tons of different kinds of drugs during labor. So then the baby, she came out, and I don't even know what her APGAR score was, but not really moving a ton because of the drugs that she got because I had to get them. Mm And, but she's taken to the transition nursery and ended up being fine and was with us and just normal baby jaundice Mm -hmm. kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Um, Wyatt, that pregnancy was great. The, they were checking me often because he was bigger. He seemed than Caroline. So we went to do an amnio to see if we should induce early, but then I was low fluid levels and they went ahead and induced early with him at 37 weeks also. He was born, however, with a perfect knot in his umbilical cord, which had nothing to do with diabetes. That it is, it is amazing. Huh? I I remember one Sunday, but I must have been like four months pregnant, laying on my side, and my belly was just jumping yeah. wildly. That's the only like he had to have tied it in a knot early in the pregnancy when there was mm-hmm. enough room mm-hmm. to have done that, but then it didn't tighten. Yeah, until. <sighs> birth and I remember the doctor looking at me after he was born and she was Mrs. Hodges because it was a random doctor that mm-hmm. <laughs> was on the floor because everything happened fast once it happened it happened fast mm-hmm. anyway I'd never met her before and she goes Mrs. Hodges your son look at him over there he is perfect and he is healthy now I want you to look at this and she held up the umbilical cord and it's in a perfect knot wow. and she's like things could have gone very different yeah. today So that's Wyatt. And then Hope was born, (laughs) thank Jesus, they induced. They did do an amnio with her, induced at 37 weeks, and she was born 9 pounds, 6 ounces at 37 weeks. Each baby got a pound bigger. (laughs) Wow. Which is a byproduct of diabetes. But each of them... Because of a lot of hard work. I mean, I was back then faxing. It's totally different than now. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. But I faxed in my blood sugars every Mm -hmm. week, Mm -hmm. every single blood sugar that I took eight plus times a day and then one in the middle of the night usually so that they could look at my blood sugars and adjust insulin levels. So Mm -hmm. by the time you're in your third trimester at delivery, 
I'm on three times as much insulin as I'm on when I'm not pregnant. Okay. And as soon as the baby's delivered, my it almost immediately goes back to normal okay. dosing. Wow. But I was able to have three healthy yeah. children. I And we would have had more. We actually were pregnant two more times, and right. we lost those babies early in the first trimester. But it was so great for my endocrinologist both times and my OB to look at me and say, this is nothing you mm-hmm. did yes, right. or didn't do from a diabetes management spot, you know, right. um, technicality yeah, or whatever. Right. Right. This was the Lord deciding mm-hmm. that these two babies, mm-hmm. this was their story, mm-hmm. you know. So I've been pregnant five times, mm-hmm. and I was able to do that yeah. with an awesome support system around me, but also just a desire to live my life. Mm-hmm. And to not say, oh, I can't do that, or I'm f- too fearful to do it that right. a baby would be disfigured or something, right. and so I'm not going to. No. There were tools at my disposal, mm-hmm. technology, doctors. Mm-hmm. It took a lot of work, mm-hmm. but I have three healthy children. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So can you explain the difference between type 1 and type 2 sure. diabetes? I know there's a lot of confusion with mm-hmm. that. So tell us what, mm-hmm. what the difference is between the two. Old school, type 1 used to be called juvenile diabetes because it was mainly young children. But then young adults like myself began being diagnosed, so they changed it to type 1, type 2. For easy understanding, type 1 diabetics is the like 5% of the total diabetic population is made up by by type 1. So it's a much rarer Mm -hmm. form of diabetes to get. Pretty much your pancreas does not produce insulin anymore. The islet cells that live in your pancreas, those are the cells that create insulin. Those islet cells are damaged or they don't work anymore. And they are insulin. This is how I was taught. Insulin is the key that unlocks the cell door Mm -hmm. to allow it to go in. Insulin is a growth hormone. So that's Mm -hmm. why when I was diagnosed, I had lost all that weight because my body was basically starving. Okay. It could not use any of the food I was eating. So it began to get its energy from fat, then muscle. Okay. So insulin is required to grow. That's why when you look at other people that are newly diagnosed, sometimes they look malnourished, a mm-hmm. lot of, especially a type 1. Mm-hmm. So type 1s do not produce insulin. Mm-hmm. A type 2 diabetic, typically it is a, it can be controlled with diet and exercise. Usually that person is going to be overweight, living a lifestyle, eating, um, perhaps there are other factors and, you know, abuse of some substances, things like that. But usually it's an overweight kind of deal. So if mm-hmm. weight, so their body is not able to produce enough insulin to manage the size that they are. And I remember asking them in the beginning, how do you know I'm type one, not type right. two? And they're like, I can just look at you because I was skin and bones because okay. I'd lost 20 pounds mm-hmm. in addition to already being thin because you're not married, haven't had children, Mm -hmm. you're this tiny thing, right? Right. And I lost 20 additional pounds. And they were concerned about that. They wanted me to gain weight. That was a big part of my early Mm -hmm. diagnosis. And so that's kind of layman's terms, a difference between type 1 and type 2. Okay. And there's no way of telling what actually damaged those cells. Like they can't... There is no known cause. Okay. I am considered an autoimmune disease. Okay. So they, when I was early diagnosed, they asked me, have you been sick in the last six months. And in September, before my diagnosis in February, I had a high fever that lasted 24 hours. Okay. What they believe happened is that my immune system kicked into gear to battle that high fever. But then my immune system got sidetracked Mm -hmm. and it freaked out and it began attacking my islet cells Mm -hmm. and killing them Mm -hmm. so that my body does not produce insulin. I did not see the effects of that. I probably began losing weight, December. You know, it took a while for things to begin happening. But the third you're probably thinking, I'm oh, losing weight. Yes, this I'm is not awesome. working out. I'm yeah. eating whatever I, I want. This is yes. amazing. Exactly. I'm dropping dress sizes, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, it was an amazing weight loss program. Mm-hmm. However, um, <laughs> I remember waking up every hour on the hour to use the restroom as though I had drunk Mm. a gallon of water in between and I hadn't Mm -hmm. drunk anything. So Mm -hmm. when I first, and so that affected my mood too. You think back to how moody I was when I was diagnosed. 
So much of that probably had to do with my lack of sleep also. exactly. Um, so yeah, type one, type two, there is, yeah, there is that big difference there. Okay. So we're going to move on from you. Okay. And almost two years ago, Mm -hmm. your son, Wyatt was actually diagnosed with type one diabetes. Yep. So tell us about that story. I will try to do this unemotionally. (laughs) (laughs) Um, since having babies, I would say this possibility was one of my worst fears, Mm -hmm. but I knew what to look for. And so I, um, it was the fall before he turned eight. So he's seven years old. It was that early November and I'm watching him drink Mm -hmm. this kind of water bottle. This is probably a 20, 30 ounce water bottle three times a day. No child drinks that kind of water. And he's not, like, running around being active. Mm -hmm. And he began drinking that kind of water. And he, like his mama, is passionate about life. (laughs) Um, So he was moody. Mm -hmm. And I remember my mom had been here for Thanksgiving. And I said, Mom, I just need you. Will you just observe Wyatt also? And will you pray that I won't be fearful of what I think might be happening? And so she started joining me in prayer about that. So Thanksgiving comes and goes. She flies home Monday morning. Monday after school, he and I sit down to do math homework, and he is math-minded. And he cried for an hour and a half about subtraction. Oh, wow. And that is unlike my child, who takes a challenge and goes, oh, this is hard, Mm -hmm. but mm, okay, I'm going to get it. No, he cried. Mm -hmm. So then as every mom, like my brain begins to go, oh my gosh, he's being molested, right? Uh, Like that, like I went, Mm -hmm. because I'm me, I went to the extreme. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, I go through everything. Is somebody bullying you at Mm -hmm. school? What can you not share with me? Is there a teacher? Is there a coach? Like what... Has any and he's not even able to answer me. So then I begin he thinking, no, he has no clue what's well, going no, on. I'm sure, but right? he was crying so hard and probably horrified at my questions that he couldn't say no yeah. that those things weren't happening. Okay, so I am like it oh, was wow. just this swirl of mm-hmm. oh my gosh, what is happening? Who is hurting you? Mm-hmm. All these things, and um, finally. We get him settled down, and he is able to answer me that, no, he's not being bullied. No, he's not being made fun of. No, nobody has hurt him or touched him or anything inappropriate. And I am just beginning to tuck all of these bits and pieces of information away, and I know how moody I was. Mm -hmm. And having extreme mood swings can be a sign of extreme blood sugar shift. So... Um, I looked at Jason and I said, when Wyatt was out of the room, this is evening time after dinner. And I said, I think Wyatt might be diabetic and I need to check him. And Jason is the calm to my crazy. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, I'm sure it's not. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm probably pretty sure it is. I'm the diabetic in this family. And I have a dear friend from back home that I grew up with, like literally since forever. And two of her three children are type one diabetic. And so I texted Mm -hmm. her and I said, Whitney, do, are the signs similar in a child that they would be in an adult for diabetes? And she said, you have to check him. And I said, I don't know if I can. And she said, you have to. And so sweet Wyatt, we sat him on the counter right there and Jason had to hold him down And I pricked his finger and I checked it and it said the word H-I, high, which means that blood sugar is too high for the meter to even Mm. read. And so we checked it again and it said the same thing. I excused myself and went out in the garage and started Mm. sobbing. And lost it. And my friend called me. It was almost like she knew I had just done it and I answered the phone sobbing. And she said, I mean, she didn't even need me to tell her. She just said, I'm so sorry. She said, you know what you have to do, right? And I said, I have to take him to the hospital. She said, you have to go now to the hospital. And so I came back in from the garage and I looked at Jason. I said, I need to, and I'm trying to remain calm and not say anything in front of Wyatt. And, And I said, 
Jason, I need to take Wyatt to the hospital now. He's diabetic. And he's like, how do you know from just, I said, I know. And he said, well, just take him to the urgent care. I said, well, they're just going to send me to Scottish Rite. Mm -hmm. This is, he will be hospitalized. We have to go now. Mm -hmm. And that was hard for Jason, I think, to trust me in that. Not from a lack of desire to get the help. I think he was just trying to balance me. Right. And, Mm -hmm. um, but more often than not, my mom intuition has been correct with other times we've needed to go to the ER. Mm Mm-hmm. And I said, I just need you to trust me on this. And I think I threw a bag together for Wyatt and myself. I think I did. I don't remember. (laughs) We got down to the hospital, and this is one of the best children's hospitals Mm -hmm. around. We've had to be there for a couple of different things. And I walked in and, you know, walked up to the triage nurse or whatever, and I explained what was going on. And I bet within 10 minutes we were back seeing a doctor. So they moved very fast which was another indicator to me that they agreed with me before they ever even right. checked Wyatt's blood sugar mm-hmm. themselves. They checked his blood sugar, and it was over 700. I don't remember the exact number. And I remember talking with the doctor, and I said, she looked at me. I think we were out of the room from where Wyatt was, and she said, you know what this she goes, I'm confirming what your suspicions were. And I said, I need to be the one to tell Wyatt. And she said, okay, absolutely. And so they left, and um, I walked in there, and they are so great. I mean, they had brought stuff to distract him, a stuffed animal and a coloring book and mm-hmm. things like that, and there's a TV on. And I looked at him, and I said, hey, buddy, I need to talk with you. And he turned and looked at me, and I said, hey, bud. I said, you know what mom has, right? And he just nodded, and I said, hey, buddy, you've got it too. You're a diabetic like mom. And those big gator tears just started flowing down his cheeks. And his first question was, will I be able to run? Oh, yes, buddy. Of course you'll be able to run. Mm -hmm. But then that sweet, precious boy looked at me and said, oh, mama, now you have a buddy. And that my sweet seven-year-old son was already thinking about me and that now I had a friend to do diabetes with. And while I have seized life up until this point, I was never thankful to be diabetic until that night. Hmm. Because now my story and the way the Lord was writing it, I'm an expert And I get to walk through this with my son. Mm -hmm. And I know what I'm doing. I didn't feel like it in that moment. And it took a couple of people, including my doctor, reminding me, Allison, you are an expert. You know how to care for him. You don't need to call me with every dose. You don't need to, oh, right, okay. Mm -hmm. But in those early moments that Wyatt saw an opportunity that we were going to do this together... Mm -hmm. You know, in Scripture, it says that we are to be thankful in all circumstances. And I had lived with diabetes up until this point. I guess it had been 15 years, 15 and a half years. And I had been fine with it. I had gotten to the point and kind of reconciliation of, okay, this is my Mm -hmm. deal. But I had never thanked God Mm -hmm. for allowing me to be diabetic Mm -hmm. until that night. And now I can genuinely say I'm thankful I am diabetic. Because I can tell my son, I know that this hurts. Mm -hmm. I know it hurts. But we're going to do it really quick and then it's over. I know. And now he checks his own blood sugar like a champ. That first night when we had to hold him down. (laughs) And now he does it on his own. Mm -hmm. Six times a day. Easy. He takes at least four shots a day, if not more, depending on if he wants snacks. They're at the pool right now. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I packed it with snacks. And he will take an insulin dose for every snack he eats there at the pool. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, um, I look at how far he's come, but I think so much a part of his confidence is from the fact that we've both been blessed to have each other. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Uh, absolutely. 
So it was my worst nightmare, coupled with the grace of our precious Lord, Mm -hmm. that he and I can do this together. And so, like, me choosing to wear the Dexcom and be a part of this new research study is to show him that I'm still fighting for this, buddy. I'm still learning things. You know, he has had an opportunity. He is still in the middle of a two-year-long trial study, which has been amazing. Okay. Um, Tell us about that. It's called the Tiger Study, and my endocrinologist called me not 48 hours into diagnosis. I had called to let them know. He called me back. It was had. It was late. It was like 10 or 11 at night, I feel mm-hmm. like, because he probably had just gotten done with all of his rounds and stuff, and he called me, and he's like, I want him in this research study, and I was like, well, okay, like, I'm just still getting my head around the fact that he's diabetic, and he's mm-hmm. like, well, we have 90 days. We don't have to decide tonight. I was like, okay, 90 days. He's like, but the sooner the better, and all of these different things, and so I was like, well, I'll call and ask more information on it later. He's like, well, you just need to know we think this might be the cure. And I was like, okay, okay. So the timing of all this. Well, sure. Because the, that trial study is now closed. Mm-hmm. Nobody else is getting in that trial study. It started mm-hmm. the August before he was diagnosed, November 28th. Mm-hmm. And um, so I'm like, okay, I'll call you when we get out of the hospital. And my brain has settled a little bit. And so I did. And we looked at all of the paperwork and all of this stuff. And there are some scary things that can happen, although they don't expect it to happen. And they haven't had any cause. No one has shown signs Mm -hmm. of these other things that could happen. And, you know, you could get the placebo, which is part of a scary part of doing a blind trial study. And he... I remember talking to our doctor and I said, well, shouldn't I look at why it may be going to a pediatric endocrinologist? And he, you got to love every once in a while, you want a doctor that is cocky. Yeah. And he, on the other end of the phone line, he goes, well, why would you do that? I'm the best. (laughs) I'm like, all right. He goes, Allison, we know you. We have known you through all three of your pregnancies and your children know us. They've been in our office all the time with you. Mm Mm-hmm. We, I want to treat Wyatt. And I, that was okay. Absolutely. So Wyatt goes there with, we set up our appointments for the same time. We got him after lots of prayer. And I called my friend that Mm -hmm. two diabetic children. And I asked her, I said, if you had been given the opportunity to be a part of a trial study, given that there might be scary things, you might get the placebo and not get the drug. Um, would you have done this with your two? She said, hands down, absolutely would never have asked a question. I would have signed the papers immediately because she looks at where her children are at now and they're on pumps all Mm -hmm. the time. They're on a Dexcom all the time. Mm -hmm. They, they don't have the possibility of reversing it or stopping it or whatever. So Mm -hmm. With Wyatt, the best case scenario is that it would reverse diagnosis. Second, Mm -hmm. you know, next best Mm -hmm. would be maybe it would lessen the amount of insulin he needs. Maybe he only would need the long-lasting insulin one shot a day kind of in the background. Maybe it would be that it keeps him in the honeymoon phase Mm -hmm. and the disease does not progress. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you get the placebo and your disease progresses. We believe Wyatt has gotten the drug. Okay. And we, this is my non-scientific, you know, I mean, I'm looking at it as comparing it to myself a year and a half into my diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I was already on so much more insulin than I was when I was first diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Wyatt is on virtually the same amount of insulin he was on when he was diagnosed. If you take into consideration how much he's grown. So he is on technically more insulin, Okay, but he only weighed, and this is what I was talking about before about the malnutrition Mm -hmm. part. And I go back and look at pictures before diagnosis and his eyes were dark and mm. he was gaunt. And I was like, oh, I just have skinny kids, mm-hmm. you know? They're active, they eat well, and they're just right. thin kids. He only weighed 49 pounds. Oh, at seven. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Almost eight. He yeah. was a week before he turned eight. And now he weighs mm, almost 70, I think. Okay. So in a year and a yeah. half. And he's yeah. grown, so I he's think. Four, almost doubled. And I think he's grown exactly. four inches. Yeah. And so my boy wasn't growing, mm-hmm. you know, he, mm-hmm. and it, so it's been, that part has been a great thing to mm-hmm. see how healthy he looks. Mm-hmm. 
So for the first year of the trial study, he had to take a shot every two weeks. There were some times where we had to be in the office because it would be a like seven-hour appointment. He'd be hooked up to an IV. They're taking blood samples every 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. You go in fasting. You drink something. They do not give you insulin, and they watch your blood sugar rise. Yeah. And then they watch it come back down, and they see if this drug is working. Mm-hmm. So seven hours there in a hospital with bed. an eight year old mm-hmm. only being able to eat or their drink pro- their protein whatever shake it is that they give and to it's them. only like six ounces or whatever and I'm sure that you know with they probably have his his glucose level under control at this point right well, well or, or you have or you have to be under a certain amount your blood sugar has to be under a certain range to begin the study that day okay and then they ch- you know for the first hour they're just monitoring but, and they're seeing where you are and then they have you drink this yeah. protein shake and then they watch your blood sugar right. rise but now, i'm sure he's probably getting an appetite back at oh, this sure. point right but so, i on those days i will fast with him and yeah. i won't eat with him so that's got to be hard it's for hard an for, 8 year old yeah. to sit there for that but long and he not is distracted eat. with technology yeah which is a great thing cuz they don't get a ton of that in our home mm-hmm. so he gets to play on a computer or a you know my phone or something while we're there mm-hmm. and then he also gets paid oh that is a big chunk of motivation for him because yeah. Legos are on the other end of the line. <laughs> so he yeah. gets paid on those long visits. It's $130. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so that's a lot of money for yeah. an eight year old. <laughs> yeah, it is that's a lot of money for me. <laughs> yeah, it is like he's already been scheming because his next long appointment will be in August. He's like, mom, this is how I think I'm going to spend that money. Da, 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 da. Can uh-huh. we look up how much this Minecraft Lego set is? Yeah. You know, he's bought some games for his DS. Mm-hmm. He's and we thought about making him save it. And then Jason and I talked about it. We were like, no, he does a really hard thing mm-hmm. every four weeks to six weeks. Yeah. And has to go sit there and have blood drawn. And no, nope, he gets to spend it mm-hmm. that day if he yep. wants, you know. But so he's also learning how to spend oh, money. Sure. He's also learning opportunity costs at yes, that point. He's absolutely. learning it's worth that when you buy this the, yeah. at this point that you don't have money to buy whatever yeah. a couple of days later. Absolutely. So you're still learning absolutely. in that. Oh, even no, there is. No. Absolutely. Yeah. So the first year of the study, it was the drug every two weeks, Mm -hmm. lots of doctor's appointments. In the second year, it is just observation. Mm -hmm. So we, the end of the first year was in February. We will go one more time in August at the six month, year and a half mark. Mm -hmm. And it'll be a long day that we're there. And then he'll go one more time at the end of February at the two year mark. And then we'll be done. Um, We don't know when we will... Or if we will ever get official word from the okay. researchers that, yes, you had the drug. Or is this the placebo effect? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it's the placebo effect. I yeah. think he's gotten the drug. Mm-hmm. And we pray that this is a step towards a mm-hmm. cure. Now, did he get to meet any of the other kids? That there was a the little study? girl that was there one day. We were there. And... Um, it had been a harder process for them. Just, it was hard for them to watch her sit there for eight hours hooked up to an IV and it was hard to get a stick. And so it was painful and these different things. And the dad was thinking about pulling and I actually got to have a great conversation with him mm-hmm. about that. Even if she's getting the placebo, like, cause he, th- he thought at the time that she was getting the placebo, I was like, even if she is the information you were providing they're no worse off. Like mm-hmm. if you don't do the study, the disease is going to progress. Mm-hmm. But if you do do the study, there's a chance. Right. There's a chance. Right. That it could halt it. It could reverse it. It can, and the information they can get to maybe figure out what the heck causes type one diabetes. Mm-hmm. That's a no brainer for me. For you to be there, mm-hmm. to be able to encourage that yeah. dad, this uh, this could have been a first generation TV yeah. for them. Oh yeah, where you're coming from a different point yeah. of view, and I was able to so share that. That was a, a great yeah. opportunity for you to absolutely have this experience with yeah. it. And then when you're Wyatt, given an opportunity, helping. seize it. Right, go for it. Yes. So, what do you think is one of the biggest misconceptions of T1D? That you, Tiffany Thompson, if you drink a sugary drink, you're going to be diabetic. Mm-hmm. It is hard now. Because I laugh it off, my son laughs it off. Not everyone does. Mm. But jokes that are made, oh, I'm going to get diabetes if I drink this drink from Starbucks that is loaded down with whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. 
And they're just, but honestly, it's, and it's not even ignorance, like they're trying to be mean. It's just people don't know. Mm -hmm. And you just don't think that that you might be a diabetic within earshot. Caroline, for instance, um, she was in a show at Elm Street last fall, and they did Elf Jr. And one of the lyrics, she came and talked to me about it. One of the lyrics, because it's Buddy the Elf, and what did he like to eat? Like what? Mm -hmm. Maple syrup, candy corn, and candy canes, and whatever. Anyway, anything sugary, right? Well, they have some, there was a lyric in that script that talked about being diabetic because of what they were eating. Caroline had a hard time singing that lyric. But then I got to talk to her about theater, about the creative world, and Mm -hmm. that sometimes that's a great thing is you get to be people you're not. I said, if if you have a hard time, then just mouth the words. You don't have to sing it. You know, there's Mm -hmm. an ensemble. You won't be missed vocally if you don't sing that one sentence. Mm -hmm. I said, but you need to know Wyatt and I are okay. And when Wyatt saw the show, he laughed out loud. (laughs) But it's because I think he's got a mom that just laughs Mm -hmm. at that. So I think that's a misconception, you know, that you're just going to get it Mm -hmm. if you might get type 2 diabetes, but that's after leading a life, a life, not a week of indulgence, you know. It's not one indulgence or even two or three. It is a lifestyle that's going to lead you towards type 2. Type 1, it's genetic, and Mm -hmm. it is something that gets triggered, Mm -hmm. you know. And I don't, um, I could have my daughters tested. Yeah. To see if they are carriers of the antibody. Oh, okay. I could do that. Uh-huh. I don't want to. If So let's say I did that. Okay. And their markers come back that they have the antibody. Mm-hmm. So now I feel like I will just be staring at them mm-hmm. going, oh my gosh, is today the day? And oh, you're extra thirsty today. Are you? Because I do that anyway. Right. If somebody says they're thirsty, mm-hmm. I already go, oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. But then, there, but Caroline now is old enough. She'll look at me. She goes, I'm fine, mom. I'm just, it's hot outside. Uh, oh, oh, right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Right. So I don't have them tested, mm-hmm. but I think some of that has to do with the fact that I'm diabetic and I know exactly what I'm looking for. And so if the girls showed signs, I could act on that fast. Mm-hmm. I pray that doesn't happen. Right. So with the, the T1D, yeah. you can actually have high blood sugar or you can have low blood sugar. So at it can diagno- go it yeah, both at ways, diagnose- right? Well, at diagnosis, it's going to be high. Right. Yes. Okay. But I, if you miss, man- you know, like you can have a low blood sugar and you can crash and mm-hmm. you kind of look like a drunk person. Yeah. You are not my, I'm kind of glassy eyed. You're not making wise decisions. You're not, I'm always, I got this. I can handle it. And Jason's like, would you just sit down mm-hmm. and let me bring you a juice box? I'm like, no. I. And he sometimes has to get firm with me and say, Allison, mm-hmm. sit here. And then I go, oh, okay. And then I kind of am all like slumpy in my seat. You know, with Wyatt, he has already done a great job of self-regulating and he mm-hmm. knows and he and he is spot on, I bet 95% of the time. If he's like, mom, I feel like I'm having a low, he is either low or it's like at 85. So he might his body might be getting ready to trend low. We okay. just checked it on the early side before it's crashed. Yeah. And so we honor that. We're like, great, get a juice box. Mm-hmm. Good job, buddy. Or he'll come to me and say, mom, I'm feeling low. And I'll be like, thank you for telling me, but go check your blood sugar. Do mm-hmm. that. You know, like, yeah. tell me as you're walking, don't feel like you have to come find me wherever I am. Uh-huh. Say, mom, I'm feeling low. You say, mom, I'm feeling low and walk to go check your blood sugar or send a sister to tell me Mm -hmm. or something. So So how are his sisters dealing with this? You know, that's a great question. Um, The youngest is like her mama and feels everything. The oldest is um, more of a thinker and processor and you won't know anything until two months after something's happened. But we were sitting here at the table one night, gosh, probably six months ago. We were having a conversation and somehow it turned, I think we were talking actually about money management. Somehow that turned into a conversation that then Caroline, Caroline began sharing that she was being bullied at school that then turned into, so it was like this progression Mm -hmm. that then she started sharing that she is afraid she's going to be diabetic Mm -hmm. and she hates this for Wyatt Because it was also some kid made a comment at the lunch table about you're going to get be diabetic if you eat that, you know, and she's sitting there with a diabetic brother. Mm -hmm. And so she defends him and she feels the need to defend me. And so it was a very interesting, like I had no idea that she was afraid she would be diabetic. 
So then you come alongside them and you say, oh, baby, I pray you aren't either. And sweet Wyatt, like he just stood there with tears coming down his face. And I was like, Wyatt, maybe you need to tell your sisters how you are. And how is this going? And he looked at them again, tears just puddling right there. And he said, I'm good. Mm -hmm. This is hard, but I'm good. Hmm. So proud. And putting my arm around Caroline and saying, of course you're afraid, Mm -hmm. but we're not going to live in fear. And we pray that this doesn't happen. But here's the beautiful thing. The Lord's given you a mom and a brother that know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And there's medicine and doctors. And like there is for this particular disease, it could be so much worse. Mm -hmm. Like we have a disease that honestly, except for a needle prick, it's not a painful disease when it's managed. Mm -hmm. I don't live in pain every day. There are lots of Mm -hmm. autoimmune diseases that are painful. This is not a painful autoimmune disease. It stinks. I have to think about it twenty four seven. I must always have supplies with me. I always also now have to have supplies for my son. Um, he is getting better. He's able to dose himself, but he's not doing all the math. He's not mm-hmm. doing all of the analyzing of numbers and reaching out to a doctor saying, "Hey, I think we need to adjust." And like, I'm caring for two diabetics, so I actually took a back seat for a while. Mm-hmm. I'm not anymore, which is good. Um, I'm taking care of me again. I was Mm -hmm. doing bare minimum taking Mm -hmm. care of Allison um, because caring for two diabetics is a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's been a good thing for our family. Mm -hmm. And he just recently went to camp for the first time, spent some time away from you. It was his second time. He went last summer as well, but um, he's now dosing himself. So every time away is just another victory. Um, so he went to sleepaway camp, but Mm -hmm. as of course the Lord would have it, the owner's wife, she is a nurse and she cared for her mother-in-law who Mm -hmm. was diabetic. Oh wow. She knows. Mm -hmm. And the Lord went before us and did that. They could have told us no. Yeah. But they didn't. Mm -hmm. They let Wyatt come. His counselors, when I go up to them, I'm like, kind of that scared mom eye look like, you're a college kid. Are you sure you've got them? They look at me and they go, we got this. Yeah. I go, okay, you got this. Wyatt, are you good? Yeah, mom, I'm good. All right, buddy. High fives. I'm out. See ya. <laughs> and, and you're just kind of tiptoeing yeah. out the door. And the nurse sent me text messages every morning uh-huh. saying yesterday was great mm-hmm. or text me, hey, he's a little bit high tonight, but they've been running around camp all night. What do you think? Okay, yes, please go ahead and do a correction dose. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, it was good for him and good for us. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the other things that he's involved in? I know that you said that he just started um, learning how to play drums, Mm -hmm. but then there's something else that he loves to do. He does. He does love to do it. We are actually, well, let me share what it is first. Um, Driving race cars. Yes. Um, (laughs) Yes. Since he was a young boy. Which can be an adrenaline rush. Oh, yes. Which can affect Affect your blood blood sugar. sugar. So, yeah. Okay. Um, since he was a little boy, he said, Mama, I want to drive cars and I want to drive them fast. Mm. But we didn't have a clue <laughs> how fast. to make that happen. <laughs> what? But let's be honest. What man, grown man, doesn't want to drive a car real uh, no, fast, right? right? Exactly. So it was no surprise that my <laughs> young man would want to do that. But we didn't know how to get into it or is it even – because he likes the unusual. Mm-hmm. He doesn't – we've tried soccer, baseball, basketball. Nope, no thanks. Mm-hmm. It's not my thing. He likes the unusual, the different. And I'm not sure he likes a team sport because if other people aren't living up to their end of the bargain, that he is frustrated by that. It might be good for him to be on a team. <laughs> there will be other ways to be on a team. But – um So we thought individual sport might be his thing. Mm -hmm. So I saw someone post on Facebook that their son had done it last summer. I was like, wait a second. How did you do this? She's actually (laughs) one of our customers in LuLaRoe. She told me who to contact. Jason contacts him through some conversation. Come to find out, Jason shares with him that their family has a history of racing. His Mm. grandfather and his great uncle drove race cars. So it's cars. in the blood. Oh, yes. <laughs> and he said, oh, really? Well, who's your grandpa? Jason shares Red Cruz. And he goes, oh, he used to drive for my daddy. All righty okay. then. Small world. <laughs> so um, it'll be a year this August. We went down, and the only thing that moves fast down there at Atlanta Motor Speedway mm-hmm. are the cars. <laughs> 
Yes. Everybody else <laughs> just Georgia. talks, you know, they will come on in. Let's take a look. She will Why her heart. would you like to drive a race car? <laughs> yes, sir. You know? Uh-huh. So we were there a while that yeah. first day, but it was a precious community of people and fun to get in there. We are taking a break from it mm-hmm. for a little bit right now. It's an expensive sport. I can imagine. Um, yes, because you buy a race car. Oh, You don't, like, rent one. They don't have cars that then you can just come down and drive. Okay. It's not like there's team baseball bats. Okay. No, you buy a car. Okay. For your eight-year-old. Can you get sponsors? You can. (laughs) sponsor. We talked about that. Sponsors, right? Yes. Sponsors look different at this age than the big boys. Mm -hmm. It's more... Sure, whenever you guys want to come, we'll, you know, through Zaxby's, we'll Mm -hmm. give you a free, you know, Zach pack or whatever it's called, you know, and they put Zach, you know, it's like, Uh you need new tires, you come talk to this tire guy. I'm thinking Tea of Life podcast. Right, yes. Come on, come on. Well, we thought Atlanta Diabetes. We thought um, Lily Diabetes, Uh like all of these. (laughs) Anyway, um, it was precious this year. Wyatt did get to meet. There is a professional race car driver. He's uh, Ryan Reed is young 20s, 21, two young man mm-hmm. driving for NASCAR. Okay. And he is type one diabetic. Oh, okay. And Wyatt got to meet him. And cool. he, it was just great for Wyatt to go. Like Wyatt, when he came, Jason said he didn't even talk about it or whatever. But as soon as Wyatt saw me, he was like, mom, guess what? And he's telling me he wears a pump and he does this and he does this. Mm -hmm. And um, mom, like he does like, like he's like me, like he's diabetic and he drives a race car, you know? And so it was just great for Wyatt to see a guy doing something hard and Mm -hmm. fun and Mm -hmm. energetic and awesome so we're taking a break from it right now just because it wasn't like Wyatt loved it when we were down there racing's hard because you can't go in the backyard and just throw the ball around like you do with baseball Mm -hmm. right practicing Mm -hmm. is difficult he can't just practice around our neighborhood (laughs) yeah (laughs) the car stays down there in the car Uh and it's an hour 15 yeah without traffic Mm -hmm. right to get down there and we're willing to do that, but Too we... Too bad Dixie Speedway doesn't right, have something. <laughs> right, But we needed to see him be a little bit more passionate about it yeah. than just, oh, it was fun. Yeah. It was great that it was fun, but it's an expensive fun. Mm-hmm. So if he wants to go back to it when he's 12, and there's another hard part. He's young and skinny and not very strong. Mm-hmm. And so to turn... They, the cars go 60, 65 miles mm-hmm. an hour. And so to turn them... <laughs> so he... Wait. So he, he at Wyatt, that age, yes. would drive the car 65 yes. miles an hour around the race car track. At and nine years old yes. now. He started at eight, but yes. So How is so that as him, a mom? It's terrifying. Wait, like, terrifying. <laughs> However, but he's so safe. I've asked him, do you feel safe in your car? He goes, oh, yeah. Even though he's spun out. He's never flipped, but he's in a Hans device, just like the big boys. Like oh, my word. Hans device, helmet, like the fire suit, uh-huh. the gloves, So can you the count shoes. this toward his, like, his driving hours when he gets 16? We should. I should ask, <laughs> right? For sure. I mean, golly. Now, let's just fast forward to high school. If I knew that there had been a race car driver uh-huh. in high school. <laughs> yep. Who had the dimples like Wyatt Hodges has and the curly brown hair and those big brown saucers he Uh-oh, calls Mama, eyeballs. you better watch out. Woo! I might have had to date the race car driver. He does make me swoon a little bit mm-hmm. when he's in his race car getup. But, um, you know, he had a blast. He, But if you go down on Friday night for practice and you wreck your car in practice, mm-hmm. you may not get it fixed in time for the race. Mm-hmm. And then that's $500 easy for an inexpensive fix, you know. So, <sighs> so yeah. Wow. So we're taking a break mm-hmm. because also he's competing against 12-year-olds who are just stronger, a little bit more courageous. So Wyatt maybe is driving a 20 minute lap, but they're dri- or 20 second lap, but they're driving an 18 second lap. And you're like, okay, that they're lapping you, buddy. And it's not because you're not trying, mm-hmm. but you're just a little bit more timid or you're not as strong to be able to hold it mm-hmm. in that position yeah. to turn at 65 miles an hour on a, you know, racetrack. So yeah. Um, but he had a great time, you know, and our connection to that community was precious uh-huh. to get to be with those other families down there. And, um, I'm sure that that relationship will stay open. And if he wants to revisit it when he's 12, mm-hmm. okay, we'll revisit it, you know, but for right now we're going to take a break. 
But he can say, I used to drive a race car. Oh, oh for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. He's got a couple trophies upstairs. So yeah. yeah. And the girls are probably like, yeah, You're yeah, right. right. He'd be like, no, look. No, for real. I drove, I owned a race car. <laughs> Number 35. All right. So we have, we've basically shown that you can love the life no matter where you're at. Yep. You can love your life no matter what you're facing, what you're dealing mm-hmm. with. Obviously, God's going to give us the tools that we need to do that. Yep. He's going to put the people in place that that are going to help us through that. But it's Mm -hmm. also our choice. It's not just because he's helping us through it. We have to choose. Yeah, absolutely. And I've seen with you where you have made that choice. Yep. And with you making that choice has also helped Wyatt make that choice. And I don't think you, if you have a child that's diagnosed and you're not type one, it doesn't mean that you can't help them make that choice. Right. Just, it, it was a gift that I had it, but there mm-hmm. are plenty of families, this is a rarity that, mm-hmm. you know, the mom and the child are going to both have it, right? But I watch my friend that both of her kids are type one, two of her three, and they've made a choice. They mm-hmm. are competitive athletes on elite soccer teams, and they live life to the fullest. They play soccer, they play lacrosse and baseball, I believe, maybe basketball is thrown in there too. So they are wow. active, mm-hmm. active mm-hmm. children. But they've made that choice. And let me circle back to that. Early on in my diagnosis, I said I felt like the disease was controlling me. There had to be a mind shift where Mm -hmm. I went, oh, no, 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 no. I control the disease. Right. I'm in charge of today. Now, my blood Mm -hmm. sugars might get out of whack or whatever, but I'm going to eat the piece of cherry, of strawberry rhubarb pie. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to take the insulin to do that. I don't do that every day. That's a special thing. However, before I was like, oh, I can't because I'm diabetic. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't to so much of life early in my diagnosis. But Mm -hmm. then I went, I can't live my whole life with the disease controlling me. Correct. I have to make a choice to control it Mm -hmm. and to do the best I can. So I utilize resources. I use technology. I get the best doctor that I can. And then I offer that to my son as well. And whatever thing you're going through, depression to miscarriage, I've gone through both of those things, Mm -hmm. to a diagnosis, a chronic illness like this. I've lost my father. He passed away suddenly three years ago. And so each of those things has been an opportunity for me to say, I'm choosing life right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to choose to go forward. Even if tears are streaming down my face, I'm choosing life. I'm choosing joy because I either believe this stuff or I don't, that life is a gift and that it's worth pursuing. And I think it's worth pursuing. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you, Allison. This has been amazing. Thanks for your... I really appreciate you being here and talking with us through this today. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. If you like Tea of Life podcast and you've got two friends who want to create the life that they love to live, tell them about us. Find us on your favorite social media platform like Facebook or Instagram. Also, right now before you forget, go to Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts and search for Tea of Life Podcast. Hit the subscribe button and never miss an episode. Thank you for listening to Tea of Life Podcast. We'll see you next Monday.